Hello, in this vodcast we're going to be looking at the evidence for global warming and this is the first of two vodcasts on global warming. The next one will look at the consequences of global warming. So the learning targets for this one are we will be identifying the greenhouse gases, we will be describing the greenhouse effects, and we explain the evidence showing that anthropogenic global climate change is occurring. And anthropogenic means that it is caused by people and that it is not naturally caused. First, we'll look at this diagram, and this diagram shows the energy balance of insulation, which is incoming solar radiation. Now, the incoming solar radiation, we see that some of it gets absorbed by the surface of the Earth. Some of it gets reflected back into outer space. The amount, the amount that gets reflected depends on the albedo of the surface that the sunlight is shining on. Like if it's very bright and reflective, then very little of the insulation will be. If it's very dark, then a lot of it will be absorbed, and very little bit of it will be reflected. For example, seawater will absorb quite a bit of sunlight, while sea ice will reflect quite a bit of it. Also, clouds will, will reflect quite a bit of sunlight. Even the light that they absorb, eventually that energy will be re, re, will be re-radiated out, and the the form that it's re-radiated out tends to be in the form of infrared energy, which is infrared, which is heat. Now the greenhouse effect, which you see over here, what happens there is that greenhouse gas will absorb the energy and then keep it from being sent back into outer space, at least temporarily, and it will stay in the lower atmosphere for a while. Now here we have some of the stuff written down. The greenhouse effect is that the solar energy that the Earth absorbs is re-radiated as heat, which is infrared or infrared radiation. And the greenhouse gases, and the greenhouse gases are gases that in the troposphere absorb and redirect that heat back to the surface. Now without the greenhouse effect would be well below freezing, which is in fact what happens on the moon. On the moon at nighttime, or in fact in the shade, the temperature is a couple hundred degrees below freezing. On the other hand, on, on, there is a runaway greenhouse effect. But here on Earth, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is well below 1%. In Venus, it's about 90%. And there on the surface of Venus, the temperature is hot enough to melt lead. It is hotter on Venus than it is on Mercury. Now here are the major greenhouse gases. And the sources that I show here are the anthropogenic sources, the, the sources that are produced by us. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is a weak greenhouse gas. It doesn't redirect a lot of heat back, but we have put a lot out there because we have been burning a lot of fossil fuels. Trees are a source because we've been burning a lot of forests, and that will put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere too. Now a sink is something that will absorb the carbon dioxide. Plants are a sink because through photosynthesis they absorb the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The oceans are a sink because they are able to dissolve the carbon dioxide. There are of course natural sources of carbon dioxide too. Uh, for example, at when, at when, or almost any organism breeds, they let out carbon dioxide and that is a source of carbon dioxide. That is not listed here because that is a natural source of carbon dioxide. Water vapor is a strong greenhouse gas and its concentration depends on the temperature. Methane is also a strong greenhouse gas. Its anthropogenic sources are livestock, rice farming, and manure, and those seem to be natural. I have them down here as anthropogenic because we are the ones that raise livestock, we are the ones that raise, we are the ones that farm rice. The livestock produce a lot of manure. If it wasn't for us, there wouldn't be anywhere near as much livestock around today, and there wouldn't be anywhere near as much rice around today. Also, in addition to that, there are coal mines produce it, as well as natural gas production and transmission will release methane. Now, methane breaks down naturally, so it doesn't remain in the atmosphere anywhere near as long as a carbon dioxide. Same doesn't hold true for nitrous oxide, which can stay in the atmosphere for about 114 years. Its main source are the denitrification of highly fertilized soils, and that's done by bacteria. And another source for nitrous oxide is also the burning of fossil fuels. Ozone is a good cop, bad cop type of gas. In the troposphere, it's a bad gas. In the stratosphere, it's a good gas. When it's in the stratosphere, 
what it does is it protects us from ultraviolet radiation. It makes up the ozone layer. So there it's a good gas. Down here in the troposphere, it is a bad gas. One of the ways it's bad is that it is a greenhouse gas. We don't release ozone directly. It's, a, it's known as a secondary pollutant because other air pollution reacts with sunlight. That will make ozone. Another pollutant are halocarbons. An example of that are CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. And this is a completely man-made material. It is not produced naturally, so all the CFCs found in the atmosphere are produced by us. This is uh, a bad cop, worst cop, worst cop type of thing, in the sense that down in the troposphere it is bad because it is a greenhouse gas. In the stratosphere it is bad because it destroys ozone. Because it destroys ozone, the nations of the world signed the Montreal Protocol in 1987 to basically cease the production of CFCs, and we will get more into that in the next chapter when we discuss the ozone layer. Okay, the next part of this is we're going to be looking at the evidence to see if the Earth is warm. So first we're going to look at surface temperature evidence. Global surface temperature measurements have been taken for centuries. Only in the 1880s did we actually have enough data where we could make estimates of the global temperature. We had enough measurements being taken around the whole world where we could say this was the average temperature globally on this particular year. And over here on this graph here, I show what the measurements taken by the United States, and this is global, this is both land and ocean, going from 1880 to say about 2010. And as you see here, that the temperature has been steadily increasing. The increase has been markedly increased in the last 30 years. And when you look at the graphs that were produced by other countries like the United Kingdom and Japan, their data basically matches the US data. There were some corrections that had to be made in the 130 so years that, were, that went into making this graph. For one thing, the instruments that we use to measure the temperature today are not exactly the same as what were used in the 1880s. They're more precise. We may be using satellites for measurement. And another change is that urbanization has, has increased quite a bit. For example, in 1880, Manhattan still had some farms. A lot of New York City was not urbanized. Queens was a, Queens was a suburb. So the measurements of a lot of areas that our cities now were not cities back then. So corrections are being made in here to take that into account because urbanized areas are naturally warmer than non-urbanized areas, known as the urban heat island effect. So what this basically shows is that in its time, there's been an increase of 1.4 degrees Celsius 0.8 degrees Celsius globally. This doesn't sound like a lot, but this temperature change is actually greater than the average temperature difference between Washington, between Washington D.C. and Charleston, South Carolina. Also, the average temperature change between today and when we had the last ice age was 9 degrees Fahrenheit. What looks like a little change is actually a big change because we're talking about an average, we're not talking about a slight change over just a couple of days. Other evidence that we have are satellite evidence. And we can use this to compare and to validate the evidence that we have at the surface. The satellite evidence started in the 1970s or late 70s. And this allows us to get a global picture of temperature, precipitation, and land cover. Now the types of errors that we would get in the measurements on the surface are completely different from the types of errors that we would get from satellites. So if there are errors in the measurements, the temperatures that we should be getting should not match. But when we look at the two different measurements overlaid, we see that by and large, they do match. So the data that we're looking here are real. So when we look at say from 1979 to 2012, the temperature is clearly rising. So global warming is occurring. And there's other data too. Heat waves are more frequent. Cold snaps are less frequent and milder. Snow, ice, and cover in the northern hemisphere are decreasing. Also, glacier and ice caps are melting. And this actually is very, very serious. And we'll get into more detail in this later. And 
seriousness of this is more in terms of causing the global warming rather than the consequence of rising sea levels. We'll see this in a later slide. And also organisms are moving due to changes in temperature. We've now seen that global warming is definitely occurring. Now how do we know that this global warming is being caused by humans and not occurring naturally? There are natural agents and there are anthropogenic agents. Natural agents would be solar activity. For example, the sun could be becoming more active over the 20th century and early 21st century and that could be causing the earth to become hotter. Or the cloud cover could be less. Also, there are certain cycles called the Milankovitch cycles. What they've seen is that the Earth's orbit stretches and shortens, and that's over a period of 100,000 years. And also, the Earth's axis wobbles in 40,000 year cycles. Basically, what that means is that if you ever spun a top, you notice that the top wobbles, and well, so does the Earth. But right now, when the Earth is closest to the Sun, it's not actually summer here, it's the very beginning of winter. When it's the reverse, we end up with actually colder winters and warmer summers and that makes that will help bring you about an ice age. The Milankovitch cycles are the cause of ice ages and the intermittent times. Volcanic eruptions can also cause climate change. When a volcano spews ash into the atmosphere that will reflect a lot of solar radiation back into outer space and that will cause the global climate to cool. But it only does it for a couple of years, and then the temperatures rebound back to what they were before. That can't be the reason, and the Milankovitch cycles can't be the reason either, because uh, we're not at the right point in the cycle. There are also natural sources of greenhouse gases, and we need to be able to distinguish between the two in order to make sure that, say, that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is due to, say, burning fossil fuels and not due to uh, say, animals breathing. There are anthropogenic agents. These are man-made agents. For example, we produce greenhouse gases through burning fossil fuels. Solar radiation can be absorbed, reflected back to space, depending on how we change the albedo, either by urbanization, say, by cutting down a forest, by building a city, or by, say, making smog. Burning fossil fuels will put out carbon dioxide, which will add a greenhouse gas, but also burning fossil fuels will produce smog, so in that local area, that will put a local cloud, which will reflect sunlight back into outer space. Let's look at the sun. The sun, through satellite measurements, and also through looking at sunspot evidence, going back before satellites were up there, is not causing the warming. But the way we know it is not causing the warming is because the solar activity is actually decreasing. If look at this graph over here. This shows the solar activity and solar activity goes in cycles of 11 years, where solar activity goes up and down over the course of seven years. And if you look at the cycle here, you see that since 1979, each solar maximum has been decreasing as time goes on. If solar activity were causing the warming, then it, we should be getting the reverse. The solar activity should be increasing. Additionally, if solar activity were the cause, then the entire atmosphere should be warming, and that in fact is not the case. Only the troposphere is warming. The layer above it, the stratosphere, has been cooling over this time. So solar activity cannot be the cause of global warming. Now for carbon dioxide emissions. Now as I said before, carbon dioxide is made naturally and anthropogenically, and we have to distinguish between the two. Carbon dioxide is produced by burning fossil fuels, it's also produced by cement production, by cutting down and cutting down forests. I've also added carbon dioxide in two ways. One is when the forests are burnt, that adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And the second is we are reducing the the plant sink because that's reducing the number of plants that are photosynthesizing, so less carbon dioxide is being removed from the atmosphere. Okay, let's look closely at this first graph over here. You notice two things about this graph. First thing is that year to year, the levels of carbon dioxide, the levels of carbon dioxide are going, they're basically going up in the winter and down in the summer. In a sense, that's the Earth breathing. They're going down in the summer because the northern hemisphere, all the plants are active, they're photosynthesizing, and taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 
And in the winter, the plants are hibernating and the animals are not. And even those that are, are still going through respiration and carbon dioxide is being added. So carbon dioxide levels go up. That's the first thing. That's the natural carbon dioxide. Second thing is that through this, even with this, the average level from year to year is steadily increasing. The steady increase comes from us burning fossil fuels and adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Now, if you look at the bottom level here, going from the year zero to 2005, you see that carbon dioxide level Carbon dioxide levels have basically been steady until we get to the Industrial Revolution, and then they start zoom and that circumstantially and that circumstantially shows that it's from how do we have these levels from the, from the historical times, and also if you look at the next slide, you see that we don't just have from historical times; we also have carbon dioxide levels going all the way back to 800,000 years. How do we get that? Well, you get it from glaciers because glaciers have air bubbles. The glaciers contain samples of air going back hundreds of thousands of years. And what we found is that today the level of carbon dioxide is 390 parts per million. Historically and going back 800,000 years, while the levels have changed quite a bit, they've never approached the levels of carbon dioxide today. And today it's 40 percent higher than pre-industrial levels. And that while plants and oceans absorb carbon dioxide, we found that half of the carbon dioxide emitted remains in the atmosphere for centuries. So carbon dioxide is long-lived in the atmosphere. It's not like methane or water that leaves quickly. Anthropogenic methane is produced by burning fossil fuels, livestock, and solid waste decay. And it's two and a half times pre-industrial levels. Also, nitrous oxide has increased 15% since 1750, and that comes from fertilizer use and burning fossil fuels. With CFCs, we know since that's not formed naturally, we're responsible for all of that. It stays up there for a long time, but its levels are slowly decreasing because we basically stopped adding to that, we stopped adding CFCs to the atmosphere because of the Montreal Protocol of 1987. For this, I just have methane. Methane is a very strong greenhouse gas. It's 25 times carbon dioxide. And they stay in the atmosphere for 10 years instead of centuries like carbon dioxide. And it's less abundant. So its effect is less than carbon dioxide. There are also anthropogenic cooling agents involved. Airborne dust and sand cool the earth by reflecting, cool the earth by reflecting sunlight. Well, those, by and large, are actually not anthropogenic. Aerosols cool by scattering and reflecting sunlight. Some of that actually comes from pollution. Aerosols are tiny liquid or solid particles. They're the visible part of air pollution. And they are increased by burning fossil fuels, especially in urban and industrial areas. Farmland is more reflective than the forest. So when the forests are cut down to make farmland, that actually will have a slight cooling effect. Also, urban areas are less reflective than undisturbed lands. So while on the one hand, you get the urban heat, heat island, it also reflects more sunlight. So when you take all that into account, globally, land use changes have actually had a slight cooling effect. But then you get some positive feedback. An example of that would be if you take a microphone and you put a mi that microphone up to the speaker that's connected to that microphone and you add a little noise. What will happen is that the microphone picks up the noise and that goes to the speaker which amplifies it. The microphone picks up the amplified noise speaker amplifies it more and more and more and you end up hearing a loud screeching sound which may end up blowing the speaker and that's positive feedback where a change in one direction causes more change in that direction and unfortunately this is happening in global warming for example melting ice the ground and also seawater have a lower albedo than ice so while melting glaciers can have the consequence of rising sea levels. The melting of glaciers and the melting of sea ice have a much larger consequence to that, in that when they melt, the ground and the liquid water that replace that area are absorbing more energy than 
the ice that was there was absorbing before. So that will cause more warming, which will cause more glaciers and more sea ice to melt. So that's a positive feedback. Another positive feedback is melting permafrost. Permafrost is found in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and that basically is ground which is other than, other than the top few inch frozen year round. Some permafrost will actually consist of three meters of organic matter. And that's just matter that is completely frozen. It doesn't decay. It's, it's just there sitting like in the freezer for thousands and thousands of years. But once it melts, it gets exposed to decomposers. On top of that, some of this permafrost, when it melts, it splits open, making a mini canyon. And that causes more melting. And that exposes more of it to decomposers. And all this decomposition releases methane. Methane, as you know, is a strong greenhouse gas that causes higher temperatures, which melts the permafrost more. And yet another positive feedback is with water vapor. When the Earth gets warm by 1 degree Celsius, and right now it's been warm by 0.8 degrees Celsius, and that increases the ability of the air to hold water vapor by 7%. Water vapor is a very strong greenhouse gas. So when more water vapor is being held, that means that the earth will be warmer, so it can hold even more water vapor. These three things will cause the amount of global warming to become magnified. That unfortunately is what we're seeing. So what is the result of this? Is the earth warming? Well, taking into account all the warming effects, the positive feedbacks, and the cooling effects, the earth is receiving 1.6 watts per meter squared of extra energy every second of every day. That means there's more than 800 trillion watts of energy added to the whole surface of the Earth every second of every day. That's actually more energy than 50 times all the power plants of the whole world. The result has been that over the past 100 years, the Earth has warmed 0.8 degrees Celsius, and most of this warming has occurred over the past 35 years. The cause of this warming is us. We have caused this warming through our actions primarily of burning fossil fuels. Now we come to our concluding questions. Number one, what is the greenhouse effect? Number two, list the greenhouse gases. Number three, how do we know that the sun is not causing the warming? Number four, why is carbon dioxide more of a problem than methane? Number five, why is melting ice a serious problem? That concludes this podcast, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.